Hey, good evening everybody and welcome back to another episode of Talking Craps. And tonight, we're going to be calm, we're going to cool, and we're going to collect. Tonight we have Ed Robinson here from Roll to Win Craps telling us a little bit about his craps journey. But before I get started, I really want to give Mark Evangelisto a shout out. You know, last week uh, we had a last minute um, a weather issue. Heavy and Mark were supposed to be on the show with us, and uh, Heavy lost power and was out of power for several hours, uh, uh, well into the next day. Uh, so we are going to reschedule. Heavy's going to be on the show sometime in March, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But uh, Mark Evangelisto, if you're out there watching, again, I appreciate it. Thank you for carrying the, sh the entire show. Uh, really appreciate that. So tonight, uh, we have, uh, like I said, we have Ed Robinson uh, joining us from his uh, craps pit. Good evening, Ed. Good evening. And like I said, he's going to be here talking about the journey. And for everybody that's out there putting uh, comments and questions, if you would do me a favor, if you would put a big Q, a capital Q in front of your question, it'll help me identify it really easily. That chat gets really busy and I, and I apologize. I try to get to as many of those as I possibly can and I know some of them fall through the cracks. But if you'd help me out, put a Q on there, I'll be sure to try to get that in for, uh, so uh, Ed can uh, answer it for us. All right, Ed, let's uh, turn the show over to you. And why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your uh, your craps journey. Uh, how did you get started with this game? Uh, I got started probably 30 years ago. I uh, had never played, never been in a casino. And I was going on a skiing trip with my sister and her husband, some of their friends, uh, out to uh, Tahoe. And my sister and her husband had, had been to some casinos, and I told them I didn't know anything about any of the games, anything to do. And so they gave me a book to read on the plane. Hmm. And I read a book uh, about different games and decided that crap should probably be one of the ones I should play and didn't know anything about it and got on a table that was as hot as fire the first time I played. It was so full that everybody was wedged in sideways and everybody was rolling the dice for about 20 minutes, it seemed like, and it didn't matter. The stick man look at me and he'd tap and say, don't you want a horn bet? And I'd say, how much? And he'd say $20 and I'd throw him $20 and the guy did a 12. You know, it was just one of those tables and in fact, there was a, a a man right next to me with a with a lady. They were a stick right one and two. And the table was so hot, he kept he kept uh, declining his dinner reservation and moving it back. <laughs> and then in the middle of his roll, the stick man pushed him his dice, and he wasn't standing there anymore. He was laying out flat on his back on the floor and they stopped the table real quick picked him up hauled him off on a stretcher and the lady he was with says i'm going to finish his roll oh, wow. so i was so i was hooked i was hooked right then and th that was your very first experience very first experience it was at the old caesars uh in tahoe <laughs> So, so, so what, what happened to the guy? Did he just pass out from exhaustion or heart attack? Or? You know, for all, I don't know. I, I don't, I assume he might've had a diabetic situation or something along that lines, but I really don't know. I mean, the paramedics scooped him up and that table wasn't down five minutes and he was out yeah. and then they were back and they were pushing, you know, they, somebody had covered his rack. This lady was with him. She didn't go with him. She stays and I'm going to finish his rope. <laughs> well that's pretty amazing All yeah right, so 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 you read a book you're on a plane you read a book uh people were yeah. skiing and i think uh, you had mentioned to me how long you were actually at that table uh well I, I kept going back to the tables and me and another person that was in the ski group uh we played for 18 hours uh one consecutive period of time went back we'd all rented a, a condo went back to the condo and i crashed for about six hours and then we went back and played for another six or eight 
Yeah, 18 hours. That's my max. That's my maximum time. <laughs> yeah, so you pretty much define the marathon session. You know, I have a good friend. Uh, that was a marathon that. session. But, I, you know, I was just having a blast. I, the, you know, they varied from, I think, maybe even as cheap as a $2 table back then in the middle of the week. No more than a $5 table. Now, did, did you say this was like 30 years ago? Yeah. yeah. 30 yeah. years ago. So you started your craps journey out in Tahoe. So where did you go for after yeah. that? Did you did you go back to the casino as fast as you could, or what? Uh, what was this? What happened? To, what happened next? <laughs> well, there's no casinos in Alabama, uh, but fortunately for those of us who like to to visit them, they they started building some in Mississippi. Yeah, and I hit a lot of them over near Vicksburg back then up in Tunica, and then uh, the Choctaw Indians in Mississippi and Philadelphia, Mississippi, opened up one. I was there on opening night back, I think that was around 92 or 93. Uh, was, I was actually there on opening night. So whenever I could get away, I played in New Orleans. I played on a riverboat in New Orleans before Harris was even there. There was a an old river boat or two. I think it was just one. But they would go out on the Mississippi and paddle around and I'd play craps. Hmm. I think you must have a fan out there in the audience, uh, Lillian. Uh, she made a couple of comments ah. out there. <laughs> Tunica. Yeah. 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 Lillian, Lillian is, a, is a good player, good friend of mine up in Tunica. Great real estate agent too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I've uh, I've had the privilege of playing in Tunica a couple of times. I've actually never played craps though. I haven't been back to Tunica since I discovered the game. You know, you you, you mentioned thirty years ago. I'm about three years ago. I'm only a few years into this journey. But yeah, uh, Tunica's changed a lot. It's not near the town it was as far as casinos. Several of them have closed. Uh, that were real popular, real big back then. Well, you know. Was it five or six years ago? Um, one of the hurricanes, and I can't remember which one it was, came through and and did some damage out there. Uh, we had some of them that were flooded, uh, and I don't know if they ever fully recuperated after that. I, I was down in Biloxi, I think Biloxi oh, and Gulfport. Well, it was the 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 Mississippi River had flooded. Oh, uh, oh, 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 yeah, the Mississippi River flooded. The Harrah's got flooded, um, and eventually did close. Yeah, sure did. Oh, the Harrah's is closed. It actually closed. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Samstown, I think, is the one that I played at the most, uh, or the Grand. I think it was called the Grand uh, when I was down there. Uh, Samstown is still there. Um, Hollywood, across the road, is still there. There's still the Fitz. The Fitz used to be called the Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there. Gold Strike and Horseshoe are the two main ones. They're side by side. Uh, those are the two most active. Yeah. casinos so one actually one of my favorite uh, casino experiences was down in tunica it happened we happened to be there uh, on the anniversary of elvis's death uh, and every one of the casino employees was dressed up like elvis and, yeah. and they were playing elvis music all night and it was just such a different atmosphere it was so much lighter and so much more fun it was it, it was just embedded in my memory as hey this is this is what gambling should be like you know this is what the casino experience really should be like and haven't had anything quite like that since all right we've got yeah. to do, we, we do have a question coming in from you from north florida dice uh, asking what is your home casino hmm i would have to say uh up in tunica probably be what i considered my home casino the gold strike and the horseshoe are both side by side um i used to do more in the gold strike now i kind of switched over now i'm kind of stuck in between i like them both depending upon which table uh but i do play down in biloxi a lot now yeah how frequently do you get to go to the casino hmm I, right now, I'm going about once a month. I've only been twice this year. Uh, last year, I went a lot after the reopening. I went about every two to three weeks last year after the reopening. Hmm. Somewhere. Yeah. I hear about Biloxi and uh, you know that it's one of the best 
I don't know, um, situations or scenarios or places to play for a craps player. It's definitely favorable to the craps players from what I hear. Um, I'll have to get down there someday uh, and uh, it's, see. It's a do. lot of fun. There's a lot, of, a lot of tables, plenty of casinos to choose from. Um, all the casinos in Mississippi have automatic buys on the 410, but they also have automatic buys on the 5 and 9. So uh, that's by their gaming commission rules. Now, the Indian casinos, they don't go by those rules. They've got their own. Yeah. But uh, uh, Biloxi's, Biloxi's a great great town to go to. we got Justin Davis out there saying he loves playing in Tunica. Good. And Tyler Maybe we'll run into each other. Yeah. Yeah, so Tyler, thank you very much. Loves listening to the show. Uh, and we've got another question coming in from Carl Peterson. What betting strategy does Ed use? So we had planned on getting into this here in a few minutes, but I think this is a pretty good segue. So let, take us a, a little bit on a journey again. So tell us about what your betting strategies used to be like when you, uh, before you, before you became educated. And then how, you know, I, you know, I invented that. I'm kind of like Al Gore. I invented the Iron Cross, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're actually, never going to live that one down. Nah, we're probably not. But, you know, when I started back then, and like on that 18-hour marathon, um, the only thing I knew how to do was make a pass line bet and a cum bet and then ask the dealers, you know, to put odds on it or something. And so I would do a cum bet, and I mean, this is 30 years ago. All right, so I would do a cum bet, and if the cum bets traveled to the five, six, and eight, or if the point was covered in, on one of them, and I had a six and eight to fill it out, I, like, I looked down at the field, and I went like, well, heck, I'm not going to put any more out there. I'm going to put it right here. So I, you know, I, that's what I did. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it, it back then it worked for me, but you know, if you play 18 hours, I guess something's working. Um, now I'm more of a place better. Uh, here recently, I'm really trying to focus on the even numbers, and I try to power press the six and eight on the first hit immediately press the four and 10, uh, collect my initial bet off. And I, I go pretty hard after that. After I've got my money off the table, I'm not bashful about pushing those compressors on up a little bit. So what is it about the even numbers? Is it just what you tend to roll a little bit more? I tend to roll a little bit more. Um, you know, obviously the four and 10 are the two hardest to hit, but the five and nine are not that much easier to hit either. Right. Yeah. Now, if they're start to hit, I put money on them. I don't, don't get me wrong, but, um, I will always collect the five and nine on the first hit. I don't press them. Uh, it's just how I do it. Uh, but I'll, if it's an $18 eight and it hits, I'll hand them $3 and I'll go straight to 42 uh, so that I can get four, you know, 50 for one on the next hit. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I'll go straight to 90 from 42, Okay. for example. Do you ever play any of the dark side I bets? I do. I'm not real good at it or I'm not real uh, knowledgeable or I'm not, you know, as comfortable with it, but I've gotten better at it. I do, I do a lot of one hit can't miss if we were on a table with a lot of people, especially the random tossers. Um, I will do the old three point Molly kind of a play sometimes with a pass, a don't pass and a, and a, and a DC a couple of times. I don't always put odds. Um, uh, the odds pay worse than the flat bet. So, you know, flat bet pays even money. Uh, so I don't always put odds or lay extra on those DCs. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's go back out to the questions. So we're going back over to Tunica. 
The dice grinder is out there asking, what are the table conditions and minimums and what type of side bets? Um, <clears throat> well, I guess side bets, he means like they're all all tall, small bets, except for the Fitzgerald. Last time I was there, they had uh, fire bet, which I'm not a fan of. Uh, they had gone to that. Um, what was the rest of that question? Other than what are the table can <laughs> minimums and stuff? You know, I've seen them. I have seen in the middle of the week in Tunica ten dollar tables. I'm seeing some fifteen dollar tables on the weekend, but they're pretty well full. Back in the summer, I saw fifty dollar tables. Wow, they were empty. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, I can't quite understand that. You know, if they've got a $50 table and they've got a full crew and nobody's playing it, you know, I, I don't understand the logic why they don't bring it down just a little bit. And, so, you know. in, in th those two casinos, to, to finish up Arnell's question, was, you know, they probably got uh, between those two casinos and they're side by side. I mean, they're just, just an alley in between them, really. Um, there's at least 10, maybe even 12 tables combined at those two casinos. Wow. All right, so we've got... it's very, very pop. Now there's a lot of crapless there. Crapless is extremely popular in Tunica. Hmm. I, I wonder why, I wonder what's so different about that location. But... You know, that location, I mean, you, there's going to be a crapless open. If there's only one table open, it's going to be a crapless table. Interesting. We had a uh, five 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 out there saying Biloxi is probably the best place in the U.S. to play craps. Yep, thanks for five five five. Mm -hmm. A couple other comments out there. Scott Boot is out there watching. What's up, Craps Nation? Welcome to the show, Scott. And Thanks our friend Scott. from Craps Hawaii, Mel Lum Ho, is watching the show in between flights from Vegas to Honolulu. <laughs> oh, Mel! <laughs> Welcome Good to the Mel. show, Mel. I hope and his pockets are hidden. Yeah, I hope so. I really hope so. And the Craps Cat is out there asking the question. What's your favorite Biloxi casino? Ooh. You know, I've had I've had a lot of good luck at the Beau Rivage, and a lot of people don't like those tables, but I've I've done well with them. Um, that and uh, there's times I really love the IP, and then there's times I just can't can't make a point. So, but I, I enjoy the Beau. Yeah. So. Uh, that was actually a popular question. We had Kay out there watching us too, and she had the same thing. Uh, you know, what's your favorite casino in Biloxi and why? Um, in well, a few minutes, we've we've got some uh, pictures that we're going to show of some of your wins down in Biloxi, but we're going to hold on to those for a couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah, the Biloxi, you know, you've got the Golden Nugget. It has no side bets at all. It's just pure craps. Um Harrah's is a small casino with two tables, but it's also got that eight foot tub that you can have this great love hate relationship with. <laughs> uh, very bouncy. It's very bouncy, even though I was there about a month ago and they've recovered it. And I think some of the bounce was actually less severe. Really? <laughs> it's still bounce, but less severe after they recovered it. But do they make you uh, stay seated when you throw? No, no, you got to stand. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah, it, it's regular height. It's only eight feet long. And they've got a dealer, they got a stick man, and they've got one dealer that handles the payouts. Uh, actually, both of them will end up doing the payouts if there's, you know, because they'll let four uh, people on the table, maybe six. That's is all. That's all they'll let on there right now. So uh, to speed it up, they'll both end up making payouts. But there's only two dealers. Okay. And it's a fickle thing. <laughs> a couple more questions <laughs> coming in. We got Craps for Life asking, uh, "What are the tables at the Beau Rivage? Are they hard or are they bouncy?" Ah. You know, everybody used to say they were bouncy. Um, I think they're kind of middle of the road. Uh, they're, they're, they're tameable depending upon, they're similar to some of the tables uh, in Vegas at uh, it's what's the, the one with the fountains, 
that one. Bellagio. Yeah, they're similar to the tables at Bellagio. Okay. Uh, but they're they're you know even there they're all different. But uh, if you get on certain tables, it doesn't take long to find where some firm spots are or where there's there's a few dead spots on a couple of those tables. Okay. We've got Tyler L asking, uh, what changes since COVID? Uh, four to a side. Uh, how many people can you get? And uh, I'm I'm assuming he's asking about the Biloxi tables. All right, all the Mississippi tables, as far as I know, on a full-size table will allow uh, four to each side. Okay, four on each side. All right. Yeah, that's that's their max. We've got Mark out there watching us tonight. Hey, Mark, welcome to the show. Ed, he's hoping hey, that he can finally meet up and shoot with you soon. So I hope can... I hope so. I hope so. We keep missing each other. COVID didn't help us out. We can't get together, but I'm I'm looking forward to. To, to throw in a few with uh, Mark. I really am. Yeah. Yeah, that would be an honor to be able to uh, be on the table with Mark. All right, let's take you about two more questions, then I'm going to move on to another topic real quick. Uh, okay. Uh, from Daryl DeJarlis, what table conditions are the best for your type of play? What What do you like to play on? You know, I don't, I don't like the hard rock tables, um, almost a slate table. That's because I don't practice on it. Um, I like for them to be firm, but I don't like the terrible bouncy ones. You know, I, I, I like I like one that's got a little give to it because that's kind of how my home rig is, is, is set up. Yeah, well, that's actually a very good segue. That's what I wanted to talk about next. So you started your journey 30 some years ago. You got hooked on it after an 18 hour marathon session and uh, uh, you come home and you, you, you told me uh, in, in some emails back and forth, you took a little bit of a break from the game and decided to get back mm -hmm. into it. So when you decided mm -hmm. to get back into it, is that when you decided to build your own table? Yeah, uh, I built my table about close to two years ago now. Um, I didn't I didn't have one. Um, all I did was like everybody else does and, you know, was try to absorb something on YouTube uh, to learn, I, I went back to YouTube to remember how to play the game. To be frank with you, yeah. Uh, and I, that's when I discovered that there's people out there claiming that they could influence the dice, and so I started watching those. And then ultimately, I had enough wins going. I, I told my wife, I said, I, I think I need to build a table so I can practice a little bit. Yeah, I, I hope you can see it on your screen, but I uh, I've got I some do. of the pictures that you sent to me, and I'm assuming this is one of your first attempts or. Uh, or the, the beginning that of the table was, down? Yeah, that's that's actually the un, the initial underlayment of the table that I that I have that I play on now. Uh, I put a felt down, and then I wanted to see how that that reacted, and I ended up putting a coat of uh, vinyl over the top of that mm, okay. um, right there. Sure did. I'm gonna cycle through a couple of pictures of of your table build. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a different location, but the same table, uh, next iteration, right? Well, same table, uh, probably the same location. I just was getting it closer to finished out right there. I had my uh, layout on it, yeah. Okay. And here we go. <laughs> okay. I, I, I love this story <laughs> about the I, I did it guess. backwards. Yeah. Yeah. I built my table before I built my room. Yeah. That's, that's not really how you should do it, but uh, it worked out. I ended yeah, up building the, test the room room. around the table. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I think we've got one more picture of the table here. Yeah. So this is your yeah. uh, finished uh, product uh, down in the, uh, yeah. in your yeah. craps pit or uh, do you have, you know, it's a very bone thrower, esque type of a of a table uh, yeah it is and it, i used his I, back when i did it I, I couldn't find anything i wished i had had known that heavy had his plans out on his site um but all i had to all i could find was some of the videos and this and that and and I, just to get measurements from mine's Mine's 12 foot inside wall to, to the inside wall on the end. So mm, okay. it's, it's, 
maybe a little longer than most 12 foot tables. Well, uh, so I recently uh, commissioned a, a table to be built and we did a lot of research on it. And what we found is a 12 foot table can be anywhere from about 9.7 inches to I think 12.2 rubber to rubber on the inside of the tub. And yep. those were in the casino uh, measurements. So uh, people who had uh, retired tables from the casino, there isn't a standard. Oh. So you just kind of have to do the best you can with the room that you have yep. and, the, and the budget that you have. So, so uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, whether it's 9.7 or 12 or 12.2 or, or I'm sorry, 11.7, I guess is what it was. But yeah, it it's close enough. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, and I I measure where I shoot from. I I shoot. I practice from nine and a half feet to the wall, and I practice from eleven and a half feet to the wall. Those are the two distances I practice the most. And that's you know, and that's important to know. Um, whether you have a ten foot table or a twelve foot table, you know, if you're if you're going to shoot from nine to nine and a half feet out, a ten foot table it's tight, but you can do it. You don't necessarily yeah. have to have a full size table in your, uh, in your craps pit. Right. So, yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's come back and take a few more questions. we got a couple more guys out there asking a few things. Tre Texas crap shooter. He's asking about Vicksburg. You ever play over in Vicksburg? It has been many, many years since I played in Vicksburg. Um, I probably, I bet you it's been 15 years since I've been to Vicksburg. Wow. I, I've heard that it's gone downhill. I don't know, but I've heard that. Okay. Then we've got Aaron Lozano. There's eight regular Good old tables. Good old buddy right there. Oh, okay. Eight regular tables, one electric table, and five crapless in between the two. I'm not really sure which two he might be talking to about there, but. Uh, he's, he's talking about horseshoe and, and gold strike. That's, okay. he and I met there and, and developed a friendship uh, last year and uh we've, we've we've played a lot of craps together the last year and uh he's a good guy i appreciate his friendship a lot i was going to ask another question the, the electronic craps table um i don't know if he's talking about those new uh roll to win yeah tables? he is okay they, they put one of those in the horseshoe over there in, in tunica took out and, one of the best regular craps tables they had and put that in yeah and, and have you had the opportunity to play on that thing yet i have a couple times i'm not a fan yet i played in biloxi as well uh i don't know if it's the atmosphere or if it's the extra I, I don't, there's just things i haven't gotten used to now you there's there's guys that really enjoy playing on them I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, I've been able to play on one a few times now, and it's okay, but I, I, I don't, I don't enjoy it. I actually like the crew. Um, I like having a crew. I like yeah. having chips, but I also like having no chips, no landmines in the in the landing zone whatsoever. There's sure. there's give and take with it with that machine, uh, the electronic yeah. interface. After you get comfortable with it, you can put your bets down pretty fast. It takes a few times, but but All right. I'm, I don't know if those machines are here to stay or not. You know, there's a lot of conversation about those things. You know, they've, they've turned one of them off most of the time uh, at uh, the Scarlet Pearl down in Biloxi. I think mm -hmm. they've. I think it's rare now for it to even be turned on. Yeah, I was listening to. Um, uh, the podcast you can bet on that and they were talking about these roll to win uh, crafts machines and there's an interesting tie uh, to roll to win here we're going to talk about that here in just a minute but they were reporting that these machines are about a half a million dollars each or you can lease them and they're finding that people are not spending the money uh, on them they they're not they're not generating the money that they hope they would so uh, you know, everybody's betting minimum, you know, they're betting one or five dollar minimums on them, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. OK, we've got another question from Fives out there. Uh, pull that off. What do you play on random rollers? Oh, good question. The best bet is no bet. Hmm. And uh, and I mean that with all sincerity. So here's what I do. If I've had a good roll 
and nobody else that I know is about to toss, I ask for a cover and I ask, tell them I need to go wash my hands because of this COVID mess. And I leave the table. And then I'll come back when the, when the, when the dice are, are down, you know, getting ready to make a turn back to, towards me or something. Um, if I'm not doing that, I do one hit can't miss. Uh, or I may, I may bet a six or eight. You know, I've got my own superstitions. If it's a female, I might bet on her or something. You know, it's just weird stuff. But you know, I I was in I was in tune uh, in Biloxi in August. I mean, in excuse me, in January, and I was doing one hit can't miss on everybody all the way around the table, and then a guy got the dice and started bowling them things down. And he knocked off my point, but he had already hit two sixes, and the point was eight before he hit the eight. So I left my six and eight up. Um, I think I threw a – covered up the five and said, let me see what he'll do on an iron cross because I'm ahead. And as soon as he hit the nine, I covered the nine. Then his next toss was a ten. I said, screw it cover the four and 10. I pushed both of the chips out to the dealer. And when he was done, I had $300 on the four, $300 on the six. So you never know when that guy's going to have that, you know, lightning in a bottle moment for you, even coming in from the dark side. So the one hit can't miss allows you to make a transition real quick. Yeah. I I'm a big fan of the one hit can't miss. It's not foolproof. And in fact, this no. uh, last oh, weekend no. I was playing it in, you know, a few naturals, a few points hit, and and or a few uh, seven outs before you hit a six or eight, it, mm -hmm. it can do some damage. The thing is, it minimizes the damage. I think is probably the best way to. That's play. it. So, and, you know your exposure when he when that when those dice are pushed to that person. You know what your exposure is. Yeah. You either play the bet or you don't. You know. Yeah. It, you you mentioned the the bowler uh, out there. Um, I, I did a video about a year and a half ago. I was on a business trip up to Minneapolis and I went down to Diamond Joe Worth uh, there in Iowa. And uh, the title of that video was, I was saved by a chicken feeder. <laughs> and, and here I am, I'm setting the dice meticulously. I'm trying to spot my landing zone and I just can't get anything going. But that chicken feeder, man, he must have gone 20, 25 rolls <laughs> and uh, brought me back from uh, pretty much extinction. <laughs> You don't ever know. You don't nope, ever know. Nope. So All one right, hit can't see. miss. Get you in there on it. Let's see what else we've got out there. Nick Boritz, uh, that tub has done some damage to him. Uh, I think yeah. we talked about that eight foot tub. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, I think SO is best on that piece. Straight out. Okay. So I th the straight, straight out, out position is the best one on that one. Hey, we've got old number seven PS out there uh, watching Palace have two nice tables a hybrid no smoking and ten dollar tables now yeah is, i don't know where the palace is is that a biloxi or a tunica uh, yeah it's in biloxi it's biloxi. in biloxi okay okay it's a very nice casino i don't i don't really visit it often i've been in it a few times but uh it's, it's a very nice casino okay throwing thunder mark evangelisto. i'm sorry what was that i said mark evangelisto he he, he likes the palace okay okay uh, Throwing Thunder wanted to give you a, a little bit of love. He says he loves that homemade craps pit. <laughs> it is homemade. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> and Dice Grinder. Craps players have awesome ingenuity in their practice rigs or tables. He loves seeing how different people make theirs. Now, uh, I don't know if you know uh, who Dice Grinder is. Uh, you might know him by by some of the forums. Uh, but yeah. he he has built one of the most... He, he built his, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, he did a fantastic job uh, on his own table. So, so, so a little love back there uh, going back. He did. He's got a, he's got a real nice there. table. He, he did a real good job. I got in a hurry. I just wanted something to throw. Yeah. I didn't yeah. even care what it looked like. I just wanted to get something to get some practice going. Yeah. Well, I started with a, uh, a $10 felt on my breakfast bar in a cardboard box. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it's every two or three weeks, I'm adding another twenty or thirty dollars, and now fifty dollars, and <laughs> just pieced it together yeah. until uh, I decided, okay, it's time to go ahead and sink some money and, and get it 
get a nice a, a nice table. Right. All right. Coming back over here, we've got Aaron a, another question. Uh, Aaron, a unicorn here reporting. <laughs> I, okay, that must be a, a an inside message to you. I'll bring it back up there so you can see. Yeah, that. yeah. I call him a unicorn because you know he he can't throw worth a crap, but all of a sudden he wins a lot of money sometimes. So I call him a unicorn. <laughs> well, it, it's good to have unicorns at your side. That's he, for sure. Yeah, you know, he's a perfect example though of how you make friendships at a table. You know, because I was playing in Tunica, and. <laughs> I was standing at the crapless table and I was out of position. I was, but it was all that was available. And I see this guy walk up, you know, and he's dressed real sharp. And immediately the dealer starts saying, Hey, you know, they call him by name. And he said, they said, you don't want to be on this table. We're going to open this table up over here behind us. And so he kind of walked over there and they were getting the table and I grabbed my chips and I started heading to the, that table because I want to stick left one. I get over there and I put my stuff down and he walks up over there and he taps me on the shoulder and says, uh, sir, I was, I was going to play this spot. Uh, I just had turned around and was talking to the dealer or something. And, and I kind of looked at him like, yeah, right. And then I was like, okay, no problem. And I'll go down and I'll shoot him straight out. And I knew another guy that had, had gone in down there and I'm throwing the dice and I think I had, you know, a 30 minute toss or something like that. It's a pretty long little toss. And he comes down there and he starts, are you Ed? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, yeah. He said, let's go have dinner and then we'll get on this table over here. They're going to save us a spot. So, um, you know, you just never know what, what kind of friendships, you know, probably a lifelong friendships you're going to make uh, uh, playing this game. And that's, that's one of the beautiful things about it. Okay, so the next question actually is a is a good segue. DJB Thunder is asking, are you self-taught? Have you taken any classes? And if so, who'd you take them from? It's a good question again. Um, I started out being self-taught, and I am a student of Steve Haltom, Heavy Axis Power Crafts. Uh, I've been to several of their classes. Um, they will they will help you either whether it's your grip. They'll you know when the first time I went was last year, and my grip was better than I thought it was. I mean I, I was self taught. I remember heavy going uh, you know that's a pretty good little grip for self taught, and they ended up just finessing a few things. They gave me a different die set and a couple of landing zone tips. I mean, they started giving me tips. They didn't really mess with my grip too much. But, uh, you know, I've seen them totally rebuild people's grips too. So um, they're, they're good coaches. I, I recommend anybody who's, who's you know, that, that's interested in, in seeking out help. They're, they're a good group to do that with. Well, and that actually makes me think um, the closing question that I was going to have for you, and uh, we're just going to bring it up now because it fits. Um, you told me about the best advice that you could give to somebody. Do you remember what that might be? Uh, the, the <laughs> I don't remember advice, what I said. Yep. Yeah, so, so the best advice, get a good coach and then yep, admit to coach. practice. You got to yeah. practice. I practice a lot. Yeah. I practice yeah. I practice uh, virtually every day, and I probably throw every night for uh, an hour, anywhere from one to two hours a night. And then I practice about 30 minutes in the morning, usually on weekdays before I go to work. And do you use a uh, bone tracker uh, to um, analyze yes, your boss? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and this is actually might be a good segue into uh, roll to win craps on YouTube. And the reason I say it's okay. a good one is um, there are very few people that actually have put videos out there on bone tracker and you have. Uh, so yeah. if you are interested in learning about bone tracker, um, search for roll to win craps, all one word in YouTube and you'll find his yeah, channel that's... after after the show tonight, I'll put a, a link to your um, YouTube channel in the chat. 
Um, sure. So I definitely highly recommend you look at, uh, you go out to his uh, YouTube channel and subscribe to it because he doesn't have a lot of videos out there. This is a brand new project. Uh, and in fact, I'm not going to talk about it. You talk about it. You, t you Tell us about your uh, YouTube channel. Started it uh, very first of this year. Uh, I, I think I mentioned to you before it was, you know, some people, Aaron and some of these other people that I've known, they kept asking me if I had a channel or if I wanted to start one. And I kept saying, no, there's plenty of them out there, but I've got a son that's uh, kind of an internet entrepreneur and he's heavily involved with it. And I decided kind of as a new year's resolution, I'd go ahead and give it a shot because I was always taping myself anyway. Uh, so I could watch my toss and, you know, I'd, if I had a good role or something, I'd take it in and into the office and play it for the guys at lunch and things, you know, just to, uh, rub it in on them a little bit. And so it was kind of fun. And then I, you know, I finally decided, well, you know what, I'll just do one and, uh, I'll try to make it as different as I can. Uh, there's no large amount of bragging or anything like that on it. It's I trying to make it practical. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's some funny stuff on there too, where, which are not access tosses and that kind of thing, but it's fun stuff to do on video. Well, you, you had a, uh, a phrase and I, I, I get this wrong, but if you can do it, why can't I, or something like that? If they can do it, why can't I do it? Yeah. 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 So, so you're taking some of those things that you see on YouTube and other channels, trying it out on yours and, uh, see yeah, just to see just see if I can do it, you know, because everybody, everybody watches the same stuff and you'll see some pretty miraculous off the wall looking things. Yeah. You know, if I can do it. Why can't I do it? Yeah. And, and, and I think I that that's great because, you know, somebody shows off a betting strategy or they show a, a, a dice set and, and it's not going to be the same for everybody. And I think it's good for the public to see different people throw the same thing. Can you replicate it? And the answer is probably not. Not without a lot it's of hard. practice. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, it is hard, especially if you don't have a, any kind of a rig or a, a tossing station, that kind of thing. But, you know, you just need a station. You don't have to have a table. Right. Some of the best, shooter, some of the best shooters I know have tossing stations. They don't have tables. Well, Mark Evangelisto is one of them. Uh, he yeah, he's one awesome of them. I mean, uh, there, there's a couple more guys that I know in, in Heavy's uh, group of people that uh, they don't have them either, but they're some, uh, they are some of the best shooters you'll ever see. Yep. Okay, let's see if we can go uh, through some of these questions real quick. Uh, first one's more of a comment. Kay uh, is out there. Kay and her husband, Rob, they had a good role on yeah. 30. Uh, on the glass table at the Scarlet Pearl. So sorry to see that one go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I met, I met Kay and her husband down in uh, Biloxi. Nice. Good people. Yeah, uh, I, last February, I, I thought I was going to get a chance to meet Kay and Rob, but uh, last minute plans changed and uh, didn't get to meet them. So hopefully I'll get to meet you guys soon, uh, Kay and Rob. You won't regret meeting them. Tyler is out there asking, how could you replicate the surface of an electronic table for home practice? What kind of material? I've only, I only know of one guy that's tried it and he bought a sheet of plexiglass, <clears throat> which is not, it might, it might be available now, but during the early COVID stuff, you couldn't find plexiglass anywhere, mm -hmm. but he, he bought a piece of plexiglass and put it on one end of his table. Um, there's a, a sticky surface to it. It's kind of like the film that you put on a, on a cell phone. Um, he used a spray, some kind of, uh, spray to replicate that sticky type surface. Um, I would think one of those automotive, uh, clear automotive finish things might work better, but I don't know. Yeah, that, that's a hard one. Um, I, I don't know about that one. I imagine as uh, time goes on, we're going to see some uh, some of that ingenuity, and uh, we'll start hearing oh, about yeah. some, some some ways to yeah, do that. Yeah, you'll hear about it. Yeah. Okay, Daryl's out there asking Ed, do you go to the casinos solo or with a partner or a team? <laughs> All the above. All the above. <laughs> um, I went to Biloxi as a lone wolf uh, in January. Uh, that was my intent. I wanted to go down there. 
uh, pretty much by myself. I took an extremely limited bankroll down there, and I really wanted to work on my uh, uh, personal toss betting and being able to restrain from betting on other people, that kind of thing. So I took a very limited role, uh, stayed for two nights, and uh, came back with more than I took, so I was happy. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, I, I can't really speak for Biloxi or Tunica, uh, but I, I play down here in Oklahoma and Kansas quite a bit. I think we have a, a bit of an advantage sometimes um, that uh, our dealers are they are just not as... Uh, I don't know, strict as some of them up north or to the east. We got Ruben out there saying, you know, sometimes uh, they force you to bid on every shooter. And the dice grinders uh, out there saying, if you leave the table, you only have five minutes uh, before they give your spot to somebody else. So that's, uh, I don't have that I have, you know, type that, of restrictions. I haven't had that time, that kind of restrictions. I mean, sometimes it takes you that long just to find a restroom. So I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I've had I've had one uh, run in with with a pit boss who was kind of nasty about me not placing a bet. Uh, he said, "You got to have action on the table if you're gonna if you're gonna bet. You're gonna stand at the table, sir." And I said, "Well, color me up because I'm not here to bet on that guy down there. I'm here to bet on me." So, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Mardrew asks uh, any plexiglass in tunica or biloxi do you, so they, do they have the uh separators um in january the only thing that the the beau rivage had it just around the dealers i don't know if they've added it since i'm hearing rumors that they're doing it in other places uh same in tunica actually they've, they've only got it around the dealers uh, but not between the shooters at this point Nick Bortz is out there saying, see you in Biloxi. And he has also All followed right. that up with the Palace also has a great buffet. Or at least they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they've got a buffet now or not. Uh, I'm very far behind in the comments, so I'm not sure what Fives is trying to tell me here. No shame in that, Dave. I threw dice against a wall to make strategies for years. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Fives is a new friend of mine. He's a dark side player, and uh, he also has a great YouTube channel that I encourage people to take a look at. Old, P, old number seven PS. If you go to Biloxi and go eat at Mahoney's uh, uh, across the street from the Hard Rock. Yeah. So coming in the next yeah. week segment, we're going to have the uh, food trips <laughs> portion. Yeah, yeah. There, there's some great restaurants. Mahoney's, Mahoney's is very popular. It sure is. Uh, I love this next question from John Lazarus. Is that Burt Reynolds you have on the show tonight? <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> tell Lonnie, tell Lonnie, I'll be home in just a little bit. <laughs> and Kay saying, Craps brings together a network of friends all over the country, especially if you take classes from one of the masters of the game. That's so true, Kay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you yeah. know, uh, Ed, you've recently kind of joined us uh, in some of our chats and uh, this yeah. Yeah. group that we loosely call the Craps Nation. There's no formality to that whatsoever. It's just a group of people who look, who enjoy playing craps. And mm -hmm. we have people from all different countries, uh, Australia, uh, Cyprus, the, the UK, Canada, mm -hmm. uh, United States. And, you know, we just chat about craps 24 seven. It's kind of, it, it's kind of amazing. This you network don't, of you don't want to have your alerts on, on that chat or you'll be up. No. all night. <laughs> no, you have to turn those things off. That's for sure. Okay, old number seven PS. Uh, what is your off axis percentage? Hmm. Both die off axis is about 11 percent. Yeah, okay, that's Kevin, right yeah. on that's right on the norm average number. So, Kevin M out there, another friend of yours, uh, saying it's good to see you. He's gonna looking forward to seeing you at the tables this weekend. I am looking forward to playing with Kevin. I certainly am. Kevin is one of those people who can nail numbers, and he and he can do it from straight out. Yeah, that's. I've never been able to be that precise that I can cherry pick a number. He's kind of he's kind of a end of the table buddy because I end up in the hook, 
because I want somebody who's really good to be at stick left one. You know, I mean, we all we all want it, right? But I don't want it if there's somebody better. So I end up uh, kind of playing down in the hook, and Kevin is usually on the end next to me a lot. Uh, we had some great times in Vegas last year, right side by side. It was awesome. All right, Ed, we're coming up close to the top of the hour, and I've got one more great question out here that I think that we'll end it with. Uh, we've got 555 asking one more question. How do you transition from throwing on your table to doing it in a casino? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I think a little bit of it is muscle memory because I do toss so much. Um, so I'm going to look and see how they react. But I'll pick a spot, usually our big six or big eight or uh, maybe maybe even the 12 on the field number. I'll, I'll pick a spot and I'll make kind of a casual toss or an easy toss to it, see if it's bounced, see how it's going to react. Uh, I usually like for my dice to be in closer to the wall, but sometimes you've got to stretch it on out there a couple of feet. Yeah, so do you um, go light on your bedding when you're – uh, approaching a new table or uh... yeah i mean i wished i could say i always do but i that that would be the smart thing to do wouldn't it do you do any kind of warm-ups uh before throwing in the real casino no um you know i'll pick up some dice in my room maybe just to pinch them grip them uh i'm getting on up there in, in age and so i want to get get my my feel going in my fingers a little bit but you know, I go down and I go down and play first thing in the morning, uh, looking for a cup of coffee. Uh, you don't hear me say I'm looking for going on a coffee run, so that means I'm going to the going to the tables and get some bad coffee for free. But <laughs> you know, uh, they don't give you mulligans in this game. You know, no. it's not like your local local golf course where you get a mulligan. There's no mulligans. The only mulligan you get, you come out toss, and after that. You got you. You're either in it or you're out. So <clears throat> that's why I practice every morning. You see, I want. I, there's a difference in throwing in the morning, and throwing at the end of the day. So every morning, I, I'll I'll practice for about thirty minutes before I go to work. And when I get up in the morning in a casino, I get up, get dressed, get showered, go get some coffee. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's one of the things that all the schools talk about. Golden Touch Crafts, Heavy, Howard, they all talk about the need to practice, the need to be very familiar with how much energy you're, you're putting into your swing, finding that landing zone, hitting it consistently. And if you do that, you might have to make some minor tweaks, but by and large, yeah. uh, you, you should be ready it, to roll. It helps if you've got a, a friend that you know and you know they're, and they're going, hey, your dice look good. You just got to, you know, you just had that bad roll or that bad turn or whatever uh are there we, we may talk about landing zones i mean kevin and i being down on the far end like that we've talked about landing zones because we're basically throwing from the same distance yeah yeah all right ed do you have any parting words of wisdom uh for the viewers tonight practice 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 um uh, be careful what you see on youtube if you go to my channel you need to be really beware uh, you might get hooked. Um, <laughs> I, you know, practice is the main thing. Get a get get if you can afford a coach. If you can afford to go to a class, you need to do it. Um, <clears throat> the biggest thing is is if you do do it, don't set your expectations so high immediately. And I kind of did that in my first class. I thought, man, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to come out of this and I'm just going to be able to set the, it's going to be great. They're going to do all these things. They're going to fix me. And it, you got to go home and apply what they taught you. And that takes time. Yeah, it sure does. Got to track those roles, bone tracker, all that kind of thing. I'm running over. I'm sorry. I'll no, no, you're, you're fine. You're fine. Totally fine. I, I just appreciate you coming on the show tonight. Like I said, I, I, you know, I just really met you personally not too long ago, but I've known you for quite a while from the, the forum. So uh, I was yeah. really thrilled when you, you started to come up with your YouTube channel and uh, a chance for us to connect yeah. on a little bit more of a personal uh, level here. So yeah, thank you very much. It. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for thanks having me. And we do appreciate it. 
All right, guys, this comes to the uh, shameless plug. If you like what you saw, please do give me a thumbs up. And if you want to be notified of any uh, future videos, hit that subscribe button, click that bell, and uh, you can follow me here, YouTube, Instagram, Discord, Facebook, and Twitter. So I'm trying to make that social media footprint well-known and, uh, and build a little bit of a name for myself. So guys, thank you. Uh, thanks again very much. Everybody, have a great weekend. And we'll, oh, oh, wait, 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 don't leave yet. Talk a little bit about some of the upcoming shows. Next week, March 1st, we're going to have Jeremy Ellerick from Color Up. He's going to be on the show joining us. March 8th, we've got two morons talking about casinos and stuff. And March 15th is going to be a bit of a mystery. In fact, it might not even be on March 15th. I've got some things going on with my schedule that week, and I might actually be in a remote location uh, being able to do the show. March 22nd is the tentative date to bring Heavy back. Now, I may have to change that because I think I heard that he might be in Vegas that week doing a class. I'm not really sure. So we're, that we will get Heavy back on here. I just don't know exactly when. March 29th, we've got Cousin Vito talking about craps on the East Coast. Followed on April 5th, Lady Luck HQ. Yep, we're going to switch from craps to slots for a week. Slots are incredibly popular on YouTube, and we're going to bring in one of the most popular uh, uh, YouTube stars uh, out there. Lady Luck HQ will be here on the show. Then mark your calendars, because April 12th is going to be another night with Howard Rock and Roller Newman telling us a little bit about his uh, uh, adventures and stories. And then on April 19th, We've got the Platinum Craps book author, Garrison Russell, here to tell us a little bit about his, uh, his book. All right, guys, that is going to do it. Again, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you guys next Monday.